So good afternoon. Um, I'm going to be talking today about following doctor's orders, legitimacy of parental authority and adolescent life insurance. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge and thank my uh, co-author, Lucas Mendocino. So today I'm going to be talking, uh, giving you a little bit of an overview. I'm going to introduce you to my background. I'm not a traditional medical doctor. Um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about legitimacy of, of authority, obligation obey, to obey, and willingness to lie, which is my major topic today, specifically with regards to uh, parents, but also as to regards to doctors. So I'm a developmental psychologist, and specifically I specialize in adolescent social relationships. So for the last 20 years or so, I've been studying uh, parent-adolescent relationships. Specifically, why do adolescents do what their parents ask? And why do they choose to share information with their parents? Um, and when do they choose to lie? And I've studied this on um, five continents, uh, uh, North America, South America, Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa. And I'm going to be talking about some of that work specifically as, as it um, uh, pertains to understanding uh, treatment adherence in adolescents, particularly adolescents with pain. Now, in the middle of all of this, I want to, one of the most important influences on my work actually is that I'm a mother. And this is me here with my son several years ago. And like a lot of people in this audience and a lot of the patients that you may be working with, um, my son was fine completely healthy kid until he was around 14 years old and then out of the blue I can tell you the day in April when he had his first migraine by June he was having migraines every day and by the end of that summer he was um, spending most almost every day in his room in the dark wearing welding glasses to get the light from hurting his eyes, curled up in bed under his covers, shaking from pain. Um, we were incredibly lucky that he got awesomely good treatment really fast. But that had a major effect on his life, obviously, and also a major effect on my life. And it got me really interested both personally but also professionally at some of the things I was seeing in uh, clinical settings that had a lot seemed very similar to the kinds of things that I'd been doing research on specifically having to do with following directions following rules and lying and that's where this research is really coming from and that's where it's really going so I started doing research on adolescents and parents' beliefs about pain because a lot of the things that my uh, son's doctors were telling him to do were exactly the kind of things that kids all over the, world, over the world told me that their parents had no right to tell them what to do. And it was fine for them to disobey and it was absolutely fine for them to lie about it. And that was something I found really interesting. So we started doing research on the metaphors that people used in understanding this idea of working through pain or working with pain or pushing through pain. So we tried to get a, uh, did a lot of qualitative work trying to understand how people kept going when they were in huge amounts of pain. But we also, and this is my major focus, we started looking at adolescents and parents' beliefs about the legitimacy of parental and doctor authority to prescribe particular lifestyle change treatments like stress reduction, doing meditation, exercising, regular bedtimes, drinking lots of water, functioning with pain, all the standard parts of a multidisciplinary research. And that really interested me because the kinds of things that kids told me that parents had no right to set rules about were exercise, what they did in their free time, uh, diet, um, 
and certainly things like meditation or stress reduction. I got interested in looking at obligation to obey. So do I have to obey it if my parents set rules about it? And particularly, is it okay to lie to doctors and parents about whether or not I'm actually taking my meds and doing my exercises and doing my meditation? So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So in the process of doing all of this, um, I read all the books that everybody reads as they're a parent or a caregiver. Uh, and they have a child that's living with uh, severe chronic pain. But I also, um, as a, an academic, had access to a huge volume of uh, scientific research, which we also drew heavily on. And most of you know this, but I just want to sort of tell you where I'm coming from. One of the things that, that people talk a lot about in literature, and we all see, is this vicious cycle, particularly with kids and parents. So where you have kids who are in extreme pain and do the sensible thing, which is natural thing, which is to rest. And they become more and more deconditioned. They spend more and more time in their bed and more and more time in their, in their um, uh, isolated from other people, which t leads to school failure because it's really hard to go to school if you can't get out of your room, you can't get out of your bed. Social withdrawal and isolation. And then what goes along with school failure, school, social withdrawal and isolation, anxiety and depression. With parents, and I say this from a personal perspective as well as from uh, a professional one, I know for myself, I spent so much time talking to my son thinking about my son, trying to help my son, that whenever I saw him, the first thing, instead of seeing my wonderful son, what I, my first saw, thought when I saw him was, how much pain is he in? And then I thought about, did he take his meds? And if he seemed to be doing okay, my next question was, did he get his homework done? So when I looked at him, instead of seeing him as a whole person, what I saw was pain, pills, and problems. There was a real focus on the caregiving part of our relationship, particularly focused around his illness. What you also see very typically in the literature is overprotection. So you step in and you bring them food. You ask them what they need. They, you help them with homework and putting together their meds and cleaning their rooms and you take away the chores and all the kinds of things that you would normally during adolescence do, which is increase their autonomy, that tends to be withdrawn because they're so debilitated and they're so, so, so sick. And then there's the anxiety, um, which is, you know, you start thinking of like, okay, if I can't get him to school today, he's going to fail this test and then he's going to fail this class. And then he's not going to graduate from high school and he's never going to go to college. He's not going to get a job. And what's going to happen when something happens to me? And all of those anxieties that goes along with the fact that as a parent, your job is to protect them from pain, protect them from being hurt. And you haven't done that. And your job is to help them make a successful transition to adulthood. And you're not doing that good, good a job of that either. Or at least that's how I felt. So as a developmental psychologist, so I focus on age-related changes in parenting, and I really spent a lot of time focusing on families. What I saw in the literature, it's a system where pain was drawing, driving changes in the child with withdrawal from activities and social isolation. And then all of the problems that started coming out of that resulting in changes in the family system with reduced autonomy demands. Now, when you talk, when at least we talked about, and the literature talks about um, pain rehabilitation, a lot of times I've been talking about vicious cycles. These are virtuous cycles. So the most effective treatment that people talk about is the hardest ones, lifestyle changes. Resuming normal activities, exercising, diet, stress reduction. The problem with that 
very sensible advice, which has been shown to reduce long-term um, long uh, problems, but also forget the reduction of pain, um, improve mood, improve mental health, is that compliance with them is really low. I could not find good data on this for compliance or adherence with adolescents, but I did find it looking at adults. And with um, men who had just had a heart attack and you would think would be pretty motivated to follow lifestyle changes, they had less than 20% of the men actually adhered to the lifestyle changes that we're talking about here right after a heart attack. And we're talking about teens. And yes, that is my son after I was telling him to, time to get to school. And what we do know about adherence in teens is that the sicker kids are, the less compliant they are. So the less likely they are. And that makes perfect sense. They're sick. They're in pain. And this stuff is hard. One of the things I think is really um, overlooked, significantly overlooked in the literature um, on uh, patient compliance and adolescent uh, rehabilitation for pain rehabilitation is the fact that it's clinicians who recommend the changes, but it's the parents who have to implement them. So the doctor is not standing there when the child is trying to get out of bed and make it to school when they're barely able to speak. That's the parent's job. And I know from spending a lot of time on parent support groups and from my own experience, the doctor says, oh, best thing you got to do is get your child to go to school. And the first thing you think of is like, he can barely get to the bathroom. How's he possibly going to do that? So I think that whole dynamic of doctor says do this, the parents need to implement it, is really understudied and under, um, under-researched. We know, don't know a lot about what makes parents effective at it because we are not thinking about it as a system. That's where this research is going. So I came to this from studying the idea of obedience and legitimacy of parental authority. And there is a long tradition of this in developmental psychology. And it comes from this idea of parents' job is to help their kids um, grow up into healthy, happy um, adults. And a lot of times that means setting rules. But parents don't set rules about everything. They set rules about some things. So most parents and most kids will agree that parents have the right to set rules about things like um, doing homework, going to school, setting bedtimes, especially for younger kids. And that's what's called the legitimacy of parental authority. Do parents have the right to set rules or regulations? And although they'll agree about things like that, parents and kids will also tend to agree they don't have, parents don't have the right to set rules over personal issues, things like who your best friend is or what kind of music um, you have to like. Obligation to obey is related to that, and it's this idea of are kids obliged to obey when they don't agree? Now, most of the parents say, I set the rules, they've got to follow them. But kids don't. They're actually much more nuanced about the domains that they say the parents have. To, it's, okay, it's okay for parents to set rules on it. And if it's not okay, it's all right for me as a child, as a powerless child, to resist. That's the literature on obligation to obey. And there's also a really large literature on non-disclosure. Is it okay to hide or lie when you're not following the rules? Now, this is what I've been doing research for a long time about. And this, I think, is really relevant to understanding this idea of adherence. So one of the most important things that we know about um, legitimate kids' beliefs and parents' beliefs about legitimacy and obligation to obey is that it varies by domain. So if you think about prudential activities here, prudential activities are safety things like wearing bicycle helmets or um, uh, not putting your hand on the stove, not playing with matches, 
not drinking, not smoking. Those are safety kind of issues. And most kids um, in the United States, over almost 90% say that that's fine for parents to set rules um, about those areas. This research is, is data from Chile and the Philippines and the United States. And you can see that they're quite parallel in both of these. So they're most likely to say that parents have the right to set rules about prudential issues. Conventional issues like what I wear um, and multidimensional issues are less. And these personal issues are things like how you wear your hair, how you get dressed, who your friends are, extracurricular activities, things like exercise, things like diet, all of those kinds of things that start getting into the lifestyle changes. Those kids are much less likely to par say parents have the right to set rules about that, that it's legitimate compared to safety issues, and you see a real decline. Same thing with obligation to obey. Most kids say, yeah, I should do what my parents say with regards to these safety issues, but in one, when it comes down to personal issues, much less. They can tell me that I don't have to obey because they have no right to set those rules. Now, obligation to obey and legitimacy of authority declines with age. So that if you move through adolescence, um, kids start out um, overall saying, yeah, 75% most things it's okay for them to set rules on. But the, by the time they're 17, it's way down for every single domain. Same thing with obligation to obey. Yeah, I should do. I should follow the rules. By the time you're 17, that's gone way down. And this, uh, these data, we have these data in the United, in actually United States, um, Chile, and the Philippines. Other people have them in China, Australia, um, and Japan. We see extremely similar patterns everywhere. So as we get older kids say more and more things they're seeing as personal and outside the legitimate domain of parental authority. Now, one of the reasons we think about this, this started out as straight cognitive research, but one of the reasons I got really interested in is I was interested in lying. And Legitimacy and obligation to obey predict lying um, to parents and whether or not you obey. So we know a lot about this. This is a lot of what we've been doing when we're, uh, we've been doing it for the last 15 years. So adolescents, we know that adolescents sharing information, that's a polite way of saying that he didn't lie, was highest when they generally agreed with their parents. So that relationship is really good. Their parents are warm. And there was an explicit rule, particularly when they thought the error was legitimate. So if I think, if my parents have actually set a rule and I think they have a right, I'm much more likely, even if I disagree with my parents, I'm less likely to lie. Adolescents were most likely to lie if they were girls, if they were younger, which is interesting. Um, and if they generally agreed and saw parents as warm. So it seems there's this whole, I don't want to interfere with my relationship here. They also were most likely to lie if there was no explicit rule. Yeah, I know what you want, but you didn't say. And if they think it's something that it's outside the, the legitimate domain of parental authority. Now, we took this idea, one of the things that really struck me when I was sitting in those doctor's offices and sitting in my son's psychologist's office and they're talking to him about rehabilitation. One of the things that really struck me is a lot of the things that they were telling him to do were exactly the kind of things that kids told me um, around the world that they lied to their parents about because they did not think their parents had the right to set rules. So we set out to study this. I could not find uh, decent literature on kids lying about medical type issues and whether um, to their parents, which is what I was interested in, or about whether they thought their, parent, their doctors had a right to do things like tell them to meditate. So we started doing a study. We had two samples. We have a small sample of 6th to 12th graders. Um, and we had a fairly large sample of college students. We did survey research um, where 
we ask them we ask them a lot of questions about pain medical conditions but i'm not going to talk about that today but we ask them about legitimacy does your does your is it okay for this person to set a role and we give them some options no it's not it depends or yes we asked them whether they set a rule that they disagreed with, whether they had to obey. And we also asked them whether it's okay to lie. Um, same thing. No, it depends or yes. Now we asked them for the, um, about, we asked all the kids about whether it's okay um, about, with, about this with regards to parents. And we asked our high school students about this with regards to doctors. We're currently in the middle of gathering data on this with, for, with our college students for doctors. So we looked at this with, um, in five different domains. Two we chose because we'd studied them before. So we have the prudential domain, which had three items. Um, and this is, if you remember, is the things that kids say, yeah, my parents can set rules about this. And yes, I should do what they say. So that was our high end legitimate, high end obligation. And also um, our personal domain. And that was, the, that was the domain that kids were least likely to say their parent had a right to set rules on. So who your friends are, what activities you participate in, how you spend your free time. There were four items there. Then we developed a new questionnaire that really focused on um, medical issues that came up a lot in rehab re research. So we had traditional things that ki healthy kids go to the doctor about. So taking prescribed meds for an illness, so taking antibiotics, going to a mental health professional for anxiety or depression, and seeing a doctor when you're sick. So that's a traditional kind of medical. We looked at preventive type things, uh, activities. So we had six items, avoiding junk food, taking vitamins, staying hydrated, brushing your teeth was in there. And we had items that I were more explicitly uh, rehabilitation or lifestyle changes. So we had nine items. So keeping a regular sleep wake schedule, going for physical therapy, restricting your diet. So things like a whole 30 diet or a gluten free diet, low tyramine diet, going to school, doing activities when you're in pain, as well as stress reduction techniques, um, exercising to keep to, um, for health reasons. So we have these five different domains that we ask them about legitimacy. Is it okay for your parents and doctors to set rules? Are you obliged to ob obey if you don't agree? And is it okay to lie? So let's look at our parent data first. So we've got our five domains, prudential, traditional, preventive, rehab, and personal. And these are the mean scores. Um, and we have it for legitimate obligation to obey um, okay to lie. And just as a reminder, this number here, one, that means that on average, they said, no, they have no right to set rules about this. Two was, it depends. And three was, yes, this is something that's okay for them to set rules about. Yeah, I have to obey. And, but it, yeah, it's fine to lie. So this is, this is no, this is yes. So let's look at this. What you see, and this is the important thing here, and I can tell you, we did it this as a hierarchical linear model. So it's a within person nested design where we contrasted uh, each of these, the mean score for each for the items in each domain against our two, uh, our two anchoring things, prudential domains, anchoring and personal. And what you see overall is that traditional medical things are looked at as prudential safety issues, health issues, it makes perfect sense. So um, these are, these are, is it legitimate? Yeah, it's fine for parents to tell me to do, to do things like go to the doctor, take my meds. Am I ob obliged to obey? In fact, going for traditional stuff for the doctors. Yeah, it's even, I, I should do that even more than other kinds of prudential things, safety issues that my parents talk to me about. The important thing here is rehab. 
Is it okay for my parents to, to set rules? No. Or mostly no. It's between no here and it depends. So this is not strongly endorsed as something that kids think that, that parents should be able to set rules about. Looks very similar to personal. Am I obliged to obey? Again, it's either no or it depends. This is not in strong endorsement of adherence. Is it okay to lie? Well, no, I should probably tell them. It depends though. This Remember, this is, it, is, it depends. So in all of these areas, the kids are saying, are looking at lifestyle changes for rehab as very similar to personal domains, which is, like I said, that was my initial intuition on this from looking at my other research. They do not feel they have to obey. And lying, maybe. Now we out looked at the same questions here with regards to, um, to doctors. Now the first thing that's important to see in this particular one, it's either zero or one. So the height here is the percent who say yes, zero would be no. So this up here is 100%. So is it okay for parents to tell me, uh, parents, excuse me, doctors to, um, say I should go to the doctor as I should take my meds. I should, yeah, that's what doctors are for. Kids say that's legitimate, um, over 90%. But you'll see how it falls down here for rehab. Is it okay for doctors to tell me to do lifestyle changes, to change my diet, to exercise, um, to go to school when I'm in pain? we're down to, um, in terms of legitimacy, just about 70%, much higher than personal, but still much lower than traditional medicine. Am I obliged to obey? Under 60% of kids say, if my doctor tells me to do normal lifestyle changes, I don't have to do it, 60%. Is it okay to lie? Still not very high. That's the good part. And I would do want to go back here. Kids said that, um, most of the kids said, um, lying was at least was okay. At least some of the time when we asked them about lying to their doctors, much lower percentage. So what we're seeing, what I'm seeing here, is that traditional medicine, um, medical treatment, the kids are saying, yeah, that's what doctors do. When you look at things for rehabilitation, lifestyle changes, they're saying that's not something the doctors should be telling, my parents should be telling me, and that's not something I have to listen to. Now, why is this important? Well, let me tell you a little bit about what we know about the whole parent-child dynamics that have to do with legitimacy, adherence, and lying. What you see, and there's a really big literature on this, not just my work, but a whole bunch of people all over the world um, have done fantastic work on this, is when longitudinal work. When adolescents think rules are outside parents' legitimate sphere, what you see is non-compliance, so they don't do it. And with the and they start lying about it. So what happens is the parents start pushing in and becoming more and more intrusive. And this sounds a lot like the dynamic with pain. The parents start stepping in, doing more stuff, saying more, saying more, uh, setting more rules. The kids start hiding things and lying more. And the parents respond first by taking over, by becoming intrusive, by giving the child less autonomy. And the relationship tends to, the kid, parents stop trusting the child and the kid stops being trustworthy. They start lying and hiding things. So the relationship deteriorates over time. Well, this is nasty. And what happens when you get a little further into it is the parent says, fine. And they start withdrawing the, withdrawing the demand, the demands because it is more important for them to maintain the relationship than to have the child adhere to the rules. Now, we know that in general about many different issues. Do we know if that works for pain rehab? No, 
We don't. But it works for 35 other issues that we've studied all over the place. So I have my suspicions. And that's where our next research is going. There's a couple things that are important that I'd like to, you to think about. The first thing that I think is really important is that these domains that I've talked about is, as prudential or rehab are malleable. They're things that we have make judgments about and those judgments can change. So most issues are multidimensional. So if you think about something like exercise, is that personal? Is that a medical treatment? It really depends how it's framed and how it's thought about. And how it's thought about is what determines how kids act on it. So framing lifestyle or rehabilitation changes within a medical context may well increase the legitimacy because it moves it into traditional medicine or prudential domain. And kids respond better to that. Second of all, I think this is a real argument for good pain education, particularly by medical professionals who have greater legitimacy. It may increase patient buy-in and agreement compliance. These are adolescents. If they agree, if they understand it, they're much more likely to follow, to follow um, guidelines because they know why they're being asked to do it. The second of all, if you start giving medical reasons for these, um, instead of just saying, well, you got to go to school because you got to go to school. If you talk up, start talking about what does going to school do for your pain? What does it do for your depression? What does it do for your anxiety? Um, what does it do to your um, ability to keep moving or to be with your friends? Putting re rehabilitation within a traditional me medical context is highly likely to improve its legitimacy. So when kids buy in, they're, again, they're much more likely to listen. They're much more likely to comply. Third of all, if you're involving uh, medical uh, doctors or health professionals in this, we saw that kids are much more likely to believe that they're legitimate and they should do what they're told. Having a doctor tell you that yoga helps is really different than having your parent tell you that yoga helps. So having the doctors and the parents talk to the kids on the same page is much more likely to get um, good adherence. It for, may further legitimize the parents as people who are setting rules that are prudential and safety concerns instead of just, I'm asking you to do this. So in our future work, we're going to be expanding our work on adolescence beliefs. We're doing some experimental work on re reframing rehabilitation to put it within the prudential or tra traditional medicine uh, domains and seeing if this changes um, what kids say about it and their adherence. We're also, and this is more important, looking at how beliefs vary by chronic condition, vary by pain education and treatment, and specifically how it influences uh, adherence. I personally think that um, legitimacy work has a huge potential for research. Um, we know from research on legitimacy beliefs in court with adjudicated youth that the way that they're interacted with in the court really changes their beliefs about the legitimacy of the legal decision and it has a long-term effect on whether or not they're going to be seen in that court again. Um, we know that parents' responses affect youth's willingness to disclose. So if parents listen and they respond warmly, Kids are much more likely to tell them when they disagree, to talk about things, to argue with them. An argument can be really good and discuss um, and talk about these areas of disagreement and problem behavior. If you're having a conversation, you can be convincing. If someone's lying, that's not a good cycle. Finally, I really believe that a better understanding of beliefs about the legitimacy of medical advice, particular lifestyle changes, has uh, the potential for improving the most difficult problem, which is getting doctors, patients, and parents on the same page. 
thank you. Um, I'm going to be in the lounge and I would love to talk to anybody about any questions they might have. Thank you.